book of Acts with me for just a moment. I saw something this week. You know how you know how sometimes you you read through the Bible and and uh, you, you you see something that you've never seen before. Uh, kind of ran across that this week, and I thought how appropriate a text of scripture to talk about our senior saints. Uh, you know, just before I preach, I had this card stuck in here with my message, and I want to read it to you while you're turning to Acts chapter 9. Our thanks to you, with warmest thanks, grateful hearts, and deep appreciation for your thoughtfulness. Words cannot express how much we all appreciate the good food sent to our home. Thanks for all the nice cards, phone calls, and flowers. God bless you all, and that's from Sister Phoebe and her family and we appreciate that good card and it's good so good to see phoebe here with us today in the book of acts chapter number nine i'm going to begin in reading in verse number 19 but i want you to keep your bible open because i want to i want to uh preach from the whole chapter um and then bring a message out of just one verse the Bible tells us in Acts 9 and verse number 19, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, Jews took counsel to kill him. But they but their lying or their laying await was known as Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you, Lord, uh, for the reading of the Word of God. We thank you for the Word of God. We pray that you'd bless its reading and bless it, Lord, in the preaching and give us understanding today. Lord, may we look at this, uh, at this situation in Saul of Tarsus' life and, Lord, you used that man of God greatly. Lord, it may not have been that way had it not been the, for the faithfulness of others. So we pray that you'll guide our thoughts and our words uh, in the right direction today in the way that you've given it to us to preach it. And we pray, dear Lord, that each will hear what thus saith the Word of God. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen and amen. Now in this ninth chapter of the book of Acts, we find that a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus has just been converted Christ. And uh, that took place over on the Damascus Road in the earlier part of the chapter. Now, he was commanded by the Lord Jesus at the very moment of his salvation experience, he was commanded by the Lord Jesus to go uh, into the city, which would have been the city of Damascus, and there he would be told further what he was supposed to do. Also in Damascus that day uh, was a disciple of Christ whose name was Ananias. And he had also received a command from the Lord Jesus that same day. And he was told to go to uh, the street called Straight. And he was to enter into the house of a man named Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but a man named Judas, and inquire inside the house about a man named Saul of Tarsus. He was further told by the Lord that when he got in there, that he was to lay his hand upon him, uh, that he may receive his sight. For when 
Paul met the Lord, when Saul met the Lord out there on that Damascus road, uh, the light, the, the glory of God shines so bright that he was blinded. And he has had, as it were, scales on his eyes. And, and Ananias was to lay his hand upon him that he might receive his sight. Both Saul of Tarsus and Ananias did as they were commanded of the Lord. And Saul had his sight restored. The Bible said he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he was baptized. I'll assume that Ananias may have been the one uh, that baptized him, though the Bible doesn't specifically say that. Now then, that brings us up to where we began reading our Scripture in verse number 19. So the Bible says that after, uh, after Paul, or Saul here, had met up with Ananias and the Lord restored his sight and he was baptized, the Bible said in the 19th verse that when he'd received meat, he was strengthened. And Saul was certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Now I'm sure for this new child of God uh, that these early days that he spent there with the disciples was probably uh, a time of learning and a time of uh, discipleship for Saul. And then in verse number 20, the Bible says that immediately, the Bible uses the word straightway, he started preaching. He started doing immediately what God had called him to do. And the Bible said in verse 20, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now, uh, he was evidently a spirit-filled preacher uh, because he got the attention of most everybody that was under the sound of his voice. The Bible tells us, in fact, in verse number 21, but all, you see that in verse 21, all that heard him were amazed. Now, they weren't so much amazed at his preaching style or amazed necessarily at the message that he was preaching, but they were amazed that this was the same guy uh, who had been arresting Christians, who had been arresting those that he was preaching about, uh, who had trusted the Savior he was preaching about, in other words. And, uh, you know, they just couldn't believe that this man, uh, and, and, they, and they even made mention here uh, in verse number 21, or verse number 22, they said, you know, uh, he came here to Damascus to do that very thing, and now... He's standing up preaching for and declaring the same Christ that he was just arresting people for. They were just, they were just amazed. They just couldn't understand what was going on. They were filled with wonder at the preaching of this great man who had just a few days before had been the greatest persecutor of the church. But you see, the difference in this man was the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the old song says, oh, what a difference when Jesus passed by. Oh, He can take the worst of the world and make them heaven's best. Amen. He can take the worst sinner and make him the greatest preacher and the greatest soul winner and the greatest Christian this world has ever seen. And we have got book after book after book of our forefathers and, and, and our brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ who lived years ago, who lived wicked, who lived evil lives, who no one ever thought uh, would get right with God. But then God saved them and, and called them into a great ministry, many times worldwide ministries of some of the... And God used some of the most evil and wicked people to do the greatest work for God. And my friend, that's what the blood of Jesus Christ can do. What a difference when Jesus passed by. And so in verse number 22, the Bible talks about the more he preached, the stronger he got. And uh, he laid the truth on everybody that would listen to him. He wasn't ashamed of the Lord. Uh, the Bible says that he preached uh, uh, that this Jesus was very Christ. He said that Jesus wasn't just a preacher. Jesus wasn't just a prophet. But he was very Christ. He was God's Messiah he was the one anointed to come and bring salvation to the world and that salvation was in Christ alone through the blood of Christ alone and there was no other way. I mean, Paul took off a of preaching and boy, he was getting the job done. But then in verses 23 and 24, the Jews, 
They had heard about all they was going to hear. They had heard about all that preaching about Jesus and salvation and the blood that they were going to listen to. And so as they did with the Lord Jesus, they got together and they planned out and plotted to kill Saul of Tarsus, who of course would later become the Apostle Paul. And the Bible says in verses 24 and 25 that they were lying in wait. They were laying in wait for him. They were camped out. They were hid out uh, uh, around the gates of the city of Damascus. And they were just waiting on him to step foot outside that gate. And they was going to get him and they was going to kill him. But you know something? When God calls a man or a woman into work, did you know that God puts a hedge of protection around about you? Did you know that the will of God will never send you where the grace of God cannot keep you? And so Paul, Saul is in Damascus and he's preaching up a storm and people are evidently being converted. The Jews are being upset and they want to kill him. And I love what the Bible tells me here in verse number 24. Evidently the Lord revealed to Saul that these Jews were trying to kill him. Uh, he revealed to him what they were up to because the Bible says, but their lying or their laying awake was known of Saul. So Saul knew about it. Now then, as we come down to verse number 25, verse 25 is my text. And, and, and I want to take a message this morning out of verse number 25. And I want to preach a message for two reasons. Number one, I want to preach a message this morning that will honor our senior saints. And I want to preach a message this morning, secondly, that will challenge the young people in this church to live for God as our senior saints have lived for God. Now when we come to verse number 25, I want you to notice that something miraculous took place. The Bible says that then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. Now that don't sound like a very in-depth, a very deep verse, but there was a miraculous work took place that night that would affect the ministry of the Apostle Paul for the rest of his life. Imagine what may have happened had God not used these disciples uh, to come to the need and to the aid of a young preacher named Saul of Tarsus. His ministry may have been uh, delayed. His ministry may have been hindered. What if those Jews would have got a hold of him and killed him? What would have happened to the ministry then. But you see, these disciples who were there in Damascus, they were not going to let the Saul of Tarsus get killed. They were bound and determined. They were not going to let this happen to the man of God. So they devised their own plan. The Jews' plan was to kill him. The disciples' plan was to help him escape so he could get to another place, a place of safety, and get on with the ministry. And so this morning, I want to preach a message that we've entitled, Holding the Ropes for the Next Generation. Holding the Ropes for the Next Generation. Now don't come to me and say, well now preacher, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that these disciples were senior saints. You're right. doesn't say they weren't either. Say amen there doesn't say that they were, but whether they were young or whether they were senior is not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that our senior saints, the ones that go to church here that have affected your life, the senior saints that have affected my life, and let me tell you what, uh, I, I could stand here most all morning, and you could too, and testify about the seniors that affected your life. And, and because of their testimony, because of their faith, because of their actions, because of their influence in your life, 
you are where you are today in the will of God because somebody that was older than you, someone took you under their wing, someone held the ropes for you, for you to have your life and for you to have your ministry. Now, when we come to this, I want you to notice a few things about these disciples. First of all, I, we don't have much information about them, but there's some things that we can see about them in this one little 25th verse. First of all, we found out that they were willing to hold the ropes anonymously. The Bible, the Bible doesn't record anything about them except this one act. Now I know that these were saved people because the Bible calls them disciples. Disciples are followers of Christ. There's no disciples uh, that follow Christ that aren't saved. If you're not a disciple of Christ, you're a disciple of the devil. There's nobody else to follow. You're either following the devil or you're following the Lord Jesus Christ. But these were saved people. Uh, the Bible tells us that they jumped right in when there was a need there. And it says that they, they took ropes and they let him down by the wall so that he could escape and get away safely. We don't know their names. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If we're doing something for the Lord just for recognition, we're doing it for the wrong reason. It shouldn't make any difference in our life whether we're ever recognized for anything that we do. As long as we do it for God and as long as it pleases the Lord and as long as it's in the will of God. Because let me tell you something, I'm not looking to get in man's record book, but I do want my deeds recorded in God's record book. And God is keeping up with it because there's going to be a judgment seat someday and I'm going to stand before the Lord and give account of myself of the works that I have done in the name of Jesus Christ and you know what there's a lot of things I can't remember but the Lord's going to know what I've done he's also going to know what I hadn't done so they were willing to hold those ropes anonymously they were willing to hold those ropes even though their name didn't get mentioned we don't know where they came from we don't know anything about their ancestry. We don't know anything about what city they were from. Maybe they were all from Damascus. Maybe they weren't. But we don't know anything about where they were from. We don't know anything about what their occupations were. We don't know anything about these people except there was a group of God-fearing, God-loving, God-believing people who were willing to help out a brother in need and held those ropes so that Paul could escape from certain death. But there's one thing that we do know about them. And we know about their spirit. Though we don't know their name, though we don't know where they were from, though we don't know their occupation, we do know their spirit. And when I think about those seniors that have been the biggest inspiration in my life, that have helped me down the road, that have shown me some time and some consideration to help me in my life and my ministry, I could see their spirit as well. First of all, I'd like you to notice that they had the spirit of cooperation. It wasn't just one of them said, all right, rest you sit down, I'll let him down, I'll get all the credit. No, no, no. They all did it together. I don't know how big a man Paul was, but it took more than one of them to let him down the wall. All it says here is the word disciples, and it is plural in verse number 25. So there was at least two of them that had to work together and cooperate together in order for Paul's life to be spared. And my friend, let me tell you something. If you're in the work of the Lord, whether you're young or whether you're a senior, it takes the work of cooperation, the spirit of cooperation to get anything done for the Lord. We all got to be pulling in the same direction. They not only had the spirit of cooperation, but they had the spirit of helps. They were willing to step in and to help out one that was in need. They also had the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And they had the spirit about them that this church has been taught from the first service of five people away over yonder on Grave Street until this very day. This church has always been taught to take care of the men of God. 
And these men, these disciples had the spirit of taking care of God's man. You know, for, for all intents and purposes, I'm one of the newcomers in this church. Uh, I, won't, I won't even be here five years till November. Uh, but I feel like I'm home. I feel like where I'm supposed to be. Uh, but I look out at all of you that have been here for so many years, been faithful to this church, down through the years, down through the building programs, down, some of you from the very start. And praise be unto God, nothing's changed. It's still the same. Following the same path, this path right here, the Word of God. And I can look around about this place and I can testify like everybody else that comes in here and visits that this place takes care of the men of God. I pray to God we never lose that. I pray to God we never get away from that. Pray we never get away from burden for the souls of men and burden for missions both home and abroad and, and burden for taking care of God's men and of God's people. So they held the ropes anonymously. Secondly, they held the ropes gallantly. They, they, let's consider their situation. The Bible says in verse number 25 that when they were doing this, it was at night. You know, my mom and daddy used to tell me there ain't nothing no good going on after midnight. Any of y'all ever get told that? If you're out after midnight, you are up to no good. And you know that's pretty well, that's pretty well true, amen. But it was at night. It was a dark time. And not only was it a dark time, uh, literally, but it was a dark time in Saul of Tarsus' life. How easy it would have been to have said, well, brother, tough luck. Sorry about that. Uh, at least you got to preach for a little while. Uh, uh, we're going home. We're going to bed. It's late. It's dark outside. And we really don't have time to help you. And, and we need to get home and eat supper. We need to get home and go to bed or, or whatever the case may be. Got to get up early in the morning. Can I let you in on a little secret? Everybody has to get up in the morning. If you don't get up in the morning, there's something wrong somewhere. But these men were willing to hold the ropes gallantly. They were willing to do it and do it all night if need be for the help of a brother. They were able, they were willing to hold the ropes in spite of the danger that was involved. Hey, you got to remember something. This wasn't a little social church gathering that was, uh, hey, let's let this fellow down by the basket. Uh, I just read to you that at every gate around the city of Damascus, there are Jews, armed Jews, lying in wait to kill the first one to come through the gate. And they hoped, thought, hoped, whoo, hoped it was going to be Saul of Tarsus. So this was a little bit of danger. What if they'd have gotten caught doing that? What if them Jews had caught them men letting, or, 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 or whoever it was, letting them, uh, letting Paul down by that rope? Oh, they'd have got in as much trouble as Saul was. They probably would have been arrested. They probably may have been executed. So they were very gallant in their holding the ropes. And then they held the ropes for a brother in great need. And how many times has someone, your senior, come to your aid and offered you up physical help or offered you up spiritual guidance or spiritual encouragement at just the time that you needed it? The Bible says that that's what they did. They came to a brother in great need. But you know one of the greatest things that they did in holding those ropes? I believe they held those ropes that day because they wanted to see the gospel move forward. You see, there was an understanding of what Paul or Saul had been called to do. You understand when I say Saul and Paul, I'm talking about the same person. They had an understanding. Ananias was flat out told what Saul's purpose was going to be. He's going to be the missionary. He's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And he said, he's going to suffer a lot of great things for my sake and for the gospel's sake. But I'm going to use him greatly. And you know something? That's why I love missionaries. I can't go around the world. I can't go into dangerous places. God's got me here. God called me to be a pastor. 
Now, I don't know what the future holds for me. Only God does. And, and if there's a change, well, then God will reveal it to me. But you know what? I appreciate these men that are willing to go into these dangerous places to carry the gospel. And let me tell you something. I want to be a part of that. I want to financially be a part of doing that, you see. Though I can't go, I can help him with my pocketbook and with my prayer. And so I believe that these guys wanted to see the gospel go on. Thirdly, I believe they held those ropes optimistically. I believe they were optimistic that Paul was going to make it out alive. I believe they were optimistic that he was going to get away. And I believe they were optimistic that he was going to be able to make it in the ministry. That God was going to bless him and God was going to use him. And I believe they were optimistic that the will of God for this young man's life would be accomplished and that the Great Commission would be fulfilled. You see, when you start thinking about people who do things for others, when they're doing it, when they're doing it for the right reason, for the glory of God, they're not doing it at all for self-recognition, for, self, for, for praise of self, or for acknowledgement. They're doing it because they see something in somebody. And they want to be a part of helping that person grow and go on in the Lord. That is a real, true senior saint that wants to help the younger to make it for the Lord. And then lastly, I'd like you to know that they held those ropes patiently. They held them patiently. I suspect it was nerve-wracking up there on the wall that night. I'm sure they had lookouts looking around. Where's them Jews at? Where, do you see anybody over there? No, I don't see them over there, but they, I saw a rustle of the bushes over here. And I bet that they were as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And I bet they let him down easy and quietly. I bet they didn't make no ruckus. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul has left the building. I don't believe they heard that. I believe they did it quietly. I believe they did it very strategically. I believe they did it very slowly as to not draw attention to what they were doing. And all the while, the providence of God was working and getting all of that worked out. You know, they probably didn't fully understand how this was going to turn out but they didn't turn loose of the ropes. They held the ropes. They probably didn't understand fully how God would use this young man that they were literally risking their own life to help. But they didn't turn loose of the ropes. And they probably didn't fully understand if their efforts would be enough. Would this really work? Will this really make a difference in somebody's life? They didn't know all of that. But they didn't turn loose of the ropes. You know, how many of you have ever heard the name Isaac Newton? You ever heard the name Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton once said, If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. If I have seen further, because I'm standing on the shoulders of John. This phrase that he quoted, its concept comes from a Latin phrase that means discovering truth by building on previous discoveries. To our senior saints that are here this morning, I want you to remember that someone held the rope for you. Someone helped you make it. You may not even be able to remember right off the bat. Well, I don't remember anybody helping me. I, I made it on my own. No, you didn't make it. Somebody held the rope. And to everybody in this auditorium, including me, I want you to look around in this church at our senior saints.
because they're holding the rope for us. And the older I get, the older the Lord lets me get, the more that I'm holding the rope for. And I don't want to let that rope go. I don't want to, I don't want to get so cynical in my life and say, well, it ain't worth it. Well, they, they sorry. They ain't going to turn out to be nothing. They ain't, ain't going to amount to nothing. My friend, I urge you to read about our forefathers in the faith and how wicked and evil some of them were before they got saved. But somebody in their life didn't give up holding the rope for them. And when God saved them, they took those influences that that person may have thought wasn't, wasn't doing a thing and changed their life forever. The Apostle Paul, I don't believe, ever forgot what those disciples did for him that night. As I read his writings in the New Testament, and may I say that had they, had they not got him down off of that wall, had they just let the Jews get him and say, well, you know, in, all, in retrospect, he's really getting what he deserves, mean as that rascal was. Had they done that, well, you wouldn't have half the New Testament that you have today. Because Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote over half the New Testament. But I don't believe Paul ever forgot what they'd done for him. You see, Paul performed many times what we call paying it forward. Taking a kindness that was shown to you and not just keeping it for yourself, but showing a kindness to others. He paid it forward. Time would not allow us to talk about all the influences Paul had on the numerous people that he came in contact with. But I know that Paul paid it forward to a young man named Timothy. He spent a lot of time with Timothy. Wrote him two personal letters about how to live the Christian life. How to live right. He preached to him how to get right and how to stay right. And how to live for God. And countless others. His parting words showed us his heart. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, uh, just a few pages over, if you want to turn, you can. If you don't, just listen. But in chapter number 20, I believe Paul remembered what they had done for him back in Damascus when he left Ephesus for the last time. In chapter number 20, in verse number 22, the Bible says... Uh, Paul says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. You know, if you ever go over and read the second chapter, or excuse me, the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul's got a whole list of things that he endured. Beatings, shipwreck, all these different things that that he got, had gone through. And all of these things Paul went through after they had let him down in the basket. These are things he encountered as God's man. But he never forgot what they'd done for him. And he knew that he had to pay it forward to those coming behind him. Because he said in verse 24 of Acts 20, Speaking of those afflictions and bonds, he said, None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, I don't want to die a bitter old man. I want to hold a rope for Timothy. I want to hold the rope for those that are following me just like they held the rope for me to let me get down. You understand the purpose of my preaching now? I'm preaching to you seniors, thanking you and honoring you for 
are holding the rope. I don't mean to pick out one above another, but I will use one example. Sitting up here on the front, Brother David Pennings. Been with it since the start, hadn't you, Brother David? Along with your dear brother and his family. Four years ago, this past July, you all know I had a heart attack and had to have open heart surgery. You may not remember the timing, but one month before I came to this church, Brother David had open heart surgery. Had a triple bypass, just like I did. And you know, that was a rope in my life that he wouldn't let go of for me. Every time we'd get together, he would say, now, how are you doing? What's going on? What's, what are you going through? And I'd come to him and I'd say, well, Brother David, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling something. Feels like fishing wire coming through my chest. He said, that's your stitches. They're supposed to do that. It'll be all right. And, and, and I, I'd tell him about this and I'd tell him about that. And, and he would say, it's all right. It's supposed to be that way. And he guided me through that healing process. That's holding the rope. He let me down to where I could be useful again for the Lord. To him, it may have been nothing. But to me, it was everything. And he's not the only one in this church that has held a rope for me. The seniors of this church, in the short four plus years I've been here, you have held the rope for me many a time. And you didn't even know you was holding the rope. But you made an impression upon me. And you have helped me in this ministry. You think it wasn't intimidating to come and stand in the pulpit of a man who started this work and pastored it faithfully for over 45 years? You think that wasn't intimidating? Fearful? Back in February, when I buried Brother Roger, I said from this pulpit at his funeral service, that I'm burying my best cheerleader today. That man was more of encouragement to me than any preacher I have ever known. And he encouraged me till the day he went to heaven. I'll never forget that. And see, that makes me want to hold the rope for other young preachers. And so seniors, thank you for holding the rope for me. And I pray that you'll keep doing it. And to those of you that are younger than me, I pray I never let you down. I pray I never fail you. I pray I never let go of your rope because I want to see you make it and do something for God. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we surely thank you, Lord, for this Senior Saints Day. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a chance on your day to honor those that have gone before us. And Lord, there are many that we honored this morning who you have already taken to heaven. But Lord, all four of these white roses on this piano mean the world to me because all four of those men, in their own way, according to your will, held a rope for me. And these men held a rope for all of us. And they never let it go. They were faithful till God called them home. Now Lord, this morning we offer an invitation. We offer an invitation to one and all. There may be someone here today that needs to be saved. I know this wasn't a salvation message. But Lord, I also know that, that, you, that you are the one that pricks that heart and convicts that heart of sin and causes them to know they need to be saved. And Lord, they've heard this morning that Jesus is the only way. I pray they'd come this morning and receive Christ. I pray this morning, dear Lord, for those who are holding someone else's rope today. I pray, dear Lord, that you would uh, revive them and refresh them and restore them to new devotion to that rope and say, I'm not letting that rope go. Lord, before this day is out, may we go 
to those that have had such an influence on our life. May we go to them today and thank them for not letting the rope go, but holding the rope. And so we all open the altars to one and all, whatever the need of the heart of the people may be this morning. I pray they'd come and talk to you about it. In Jesus' name.